over the 11 or so years that I've been in the truth, I've come to, to love the Bible, as I'm sure many of us, and all of us, I hope, have. And I would never have imagined that I would have drawn as close to the Bible as I have. It's a book that's been with me from the time of uh, my youth, but it's really only since I've come into the truth that the scales have, have fallen from my, my eyes, so to speak, and that, God willing, the truth has taken on a profound sense of clarity, of my understanding of my Creator, my Savior, of my life. Something which we as brothers and sisters share, again, God willing. Yet the more I read the Bible, the more I appreciate that I'm just really an infant in terms of its understanding. And the more I appreciate that I will no doubt continue to learn the wonderful lessons that it has to teach us until I draw my last breath. But in the course of reading the Bible continuously as we do, uh, there are several books which I've come to love in particular. The list seems to grow every year, thankfully. And so perhaps my destiny is to, at some point in time, be able to say that I love all of the books of the Bible equally because I've come to understand how all of them knit together to bring the truth to all of us so that we properly and fully understand the message that God has brought. But for now, certainly the stage I'm at in my journey now, books like Genesis and Exodus, um, the Psalms and Proverbs, um, Ecclesiastes, Job to some degree. I mean, Job for me is always a work in progress. I'm not sure I'll ever quite get to grips with the full extent of Job. But Jeremiah and Isaiah, Matthew, uh, the Acts, Romans, Hebrews, James, and John's letters always bring an enormous sense of joy to me each time we reach that part of the year we get to read those books. But if I had to select one book, one writer above all, which brings the most joy and the most peace, and very importantly, the most understanding of my very being and of my relationship with Yahweh and with the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to be the Gospel of John. God's creation, as perfect as it was and as perfect as we know it will be, in the fullness of time, of course, has for now become one of orderly disorder. Creation, of course, remaining orderly, but the disorder of death and hurt and pain, suffering, envy, murder and strife, being everywhere evident and apparent. And certainly for me, John's gospel helps make sense of all of this and helps me to bring peace to my understanding of what goes on around me. The beloved disciple, John, teaches us about love, godly love in all of its glory, he teaches us the reciprocity of true love, for the beloved disciple also loved. Not least he loved his Lord and he loved his master. His writings provide, provide some of the most profound thoughts. As one of the brothers explains about um, the Apostle John's writings, and uh, this is from John Carter, one of the sources that I used for preparing the paper, and he's in the Gospel of John. Where he says, where else can we read a statement expressed in monosyllables, which yet calls for such continued application of thought to understand it, as that contained in the opening verses of the fourth gospel? Now, for some time, I wanted to prepare a short study on uh, the book of John, and in particular, chapter 1 and verses 1 to 18, um, our reading which Brother Michael did for us this afternoon. Its introduction to the rest of John's gospel being profound, its introduction to the Apostle John being very telling, just those first 18 verses, and its echoes with the introductions to the other books of the Bible being evident and interesting, not least, of course, as we'll discuss a little bit this afternoon, chapter one of Genesis. And yet the possibility of tripping us into believing Christ as someone is something that he's not, is immediately apparent as soon as we start looking at at John 1. And I've taken just uh, two examples of the internet um, that I picked up. There's obviously many more. But the tr Trinitarian doctrine, and we'll chat about that briefly this afternoon, um, certainly uses John 1 as, as uh, evidence of why the Trinity is correct. Uh, as I say, I've just picked two examples there. The first one 
from Bible study tools, which says, if there ever was doubt about the deity of Jesus, John 1 sets the record straight. From the beginning, Jesus existed. He was with God. He was God. In fact, the book of Hebrews records Jesus as the creator of all things. And the other example that I pulled off from the Christian library, uh, it says, after his opening reference to the plurality, plurality of divine persons that have existed from the beginning, John 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, John explicitly, it claims, teaches his gospel the mystery of the three distinct persons, each of whom is fully God. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are revealed in God as he is in himself. Of course, the doctrine we as Christadelphians, and those of you who aren't Christadelphians, but hopefully uh, have had some uh, understanding of, of our views, um, will we'll know that we don't believe in this particular doctrine, the doctrine of the Trinity. And certainly most of the audience sitting here, I wouldn't have even begin to attempt to convince that you reject it. In fact, on the contrary, the paper that I'm going to present to you this afternoon is really starts from the premise that taken as a whole, the Bible makes it clear that there is one God, one Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the only living God, who through the power of the Holy Spirit, or God's power, was born of a virgin, but born flesh and blood, just like all of us. And who through love, learning, wisdom, and dedication came to appreciate who he was and the role in God's purpose and plan that he's here to serve. And that is what this paper sets out to consider from the perspective of the Apostle John. But before we consider it in more detail, two brief caveats. The first is that I chose the topic with some trepidation. Now, on the one hand, because no doubt many of you of the, your own years in the truth have come to consider and understand John 1, so that considering again may or may not add to your particular understanding of the chapter, you may really be very comfortable in your understanding of how John 1 applies. But what gave me some comfort and confidence and courage to continue preparing the topic was that the sources that I used, and I only used Christadelphian sources to prepare the paper, uh, all seem to indicate that even amongst the brother and sisterhood, there remains a lot of debate and consideration about exactly what um, the scope of John 1 and particularly the prologue of John 1, John chapter 1, means. Um, I, as you've already, I've already mentioned, use two sources in particular. One is uh, Brother John Carter's book, The Gospel of John. It's a book that he compiled in 1943 after several years of seminars uh, which took place um, on, on the book of John, just on the book of John, and he then put together um, that particular book, um, which is very, very helpful. The second one that I use is a far more contemporary book. It was written in 2019 by Brother John Hellowell, and it's called We Beheld His Glory, a commentary on the Gospel of John. But both make it clear that there remains within the Christadelphian family a range of views of the full meaning of John 1. So perhaps there's something for us still to consider. And the second caveat is the one that I've touched on already, and that is that although... Um, and let me say it's far less of a concern for me than the first one was when I put it together. It always amazes me, and we I constantly need to remind myself just how minority our view is of what John 1 actually means. Um, the Trinitarian view amongst the Christian world clearly still holds, holds overwhelming sway. I've just taken that. Um, in fact, there was another slide that I prepared several years ago for another talk, and I couldn't find it which I think was actually better than this slide, but this one still illustrates the point. Uh, this is an American theological view. It's just a survey done within the United States itself. Um, but if you have a look just at the top uh, little graph, where it talks about there is one true God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that clearly the Trinitarian view. And you'll see that the overwhelming majority of American Christians, so-called Christians, or Christians, believe that the Trinity is the correct um, theology and the correct approach. 20% say that they disagree, but keep in mind that of that 20%, a number of those could in fact not be Christians at all. So in fact, the Christians in America who actually believe as we do, that there is one God, the Father, 
and that there is a son of God rather than God the son is particularly small. And the slide that I, I wish I could have, or the diagram I wish I could have shown you, when you look at the pie graph, you'll see that the Christians who hold our view is in fact a very, very small slither amongst that pie graph. So that notwithstanding, um, it, it just demonstrates how important it is to properly get to grips with John chapter one and the prologue. But before we consider how John explains God and the role of Christ, let's briefly consider the Apostle John himself. And let's start off with the fact that John is in fact not mentioned once in his gospel, certainly not by name. He is spoken of only as the disciple whom Jesus loved. As a result, there been, has been and there continues to be the inevitable debates amongst the Christian world as to whether John is in fact the author and we don't need to go into that debate in any great detail. In fact, we could spend an entire session and probably a couple of sessions debating who John may or may not be. But what I thought it was worth doing is at least just highlighting a couple of points um, that support the fact that John the Apostle is the author of the Gospel of John, the fourth book, or the fourth Gospel of the New Testament. So a couple of points are firstly the following. One, it seems quite obvious that John was reluctant to name himself. But in fact, by avoiding John, by John avoiding doing so, it in fact emphasizes the point that he was the author of the gospel, which if that sounds counterintuitive, let me explain. So the, the key question that needs to be asked is, why should a disciple wish to remain anonymous from the book that he was writing? And it seems highly probable, particularly from the way in which John wrote, his, where his nature comes forward, that he was particularly modest and he didn't want to include his name in the gospel. And it's not the only example in the New Testament of where writers prefer to stay, to stay anonymous. Luke, for example, doesn't mention his name at all, other than the fact that he every now and again refers to the plural we when he refers to um, being uh, to a particular topic that he's relating. That's the only instance that we can actually appreciate that it's him. So his, the fact that John doesn't name himself doesn't necessarily discount him altogether. The second point is that the close involvement of John with the Lord, and we know from the writings how close John was to our, our Lord Jesus Christ, during several important episodes um, in his ministry means that he was an eyewitness. So he was very well placed. Of course, anyone who sees something firsthand is always going to be better placed than someone who's writing it secondhand or thirdhand to relate these in his gospel. And given the nature of the topics which John covers in his gospel, certainly for me, um, an eyewitness account would probably have been important in a number of them. Thirdly, the, in the first three gospels, John figures prominently with Peter and James. But John and James are not referred to at all in the fourth gospel. And their mother is not referred to by name, but is simply referred to as the sister of Mary. Fourth point is that the loved disciple was uh, um, in place in a number of the most important instances or occurrences that to take place in John's gospel. In fact, John referred to as the beloved disciple um, is referred to in that way five times in the gospel of John. Firstly, in chapter 13 and verse 23 at the Last Supper, probably the most famous one where he was reclining at the table in Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. In, verse, in chapter 19 and verse 26, John, or the beloved disciple, was at the cross, where Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. At the tomb, after Christ had been taken down from the cross, and Simon Peter and John ran to see whether the tomb was in fact empty in chapter 20 and verses 2 and 3. It says, Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and they went towards the tomb. The fourth instance was at the lakeside after the resurrection of Christ in chapter 21 and verse 7, where there's reference to the disciple whom Jesus loved. And lastly, when Peter turned back, when Jesus was um, reinstating Peter in chapter 21 and verse 20, where he turned back and it refers to the disciple whom Jesus loved. So the reference and the importance of John in, in his role in this particular gospel is highly evident. 
Now, John was probably the younger brother of James, um, simply because in the New Testament, they generally refer to as James and John. And certainly when I was growing up, my sister who's older than me, our family was always referred to as Cindy and Ian, uh, generally going to place the elder brother or the elder sibling in front of the younger one when you name them. Um, and uh, was the, they were the children of Zebedee and Salome. And we know that Salome was the, the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so they were related. And you can see from that slide that, in fact, uh, several of the uh, apostles were related, the ones that are highlighted in bold, being those that were related in some way to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not all of them, but certainly some of them. And certainly John, for our purposes this afternoon, was a close relative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, supporting the fact that he would have a direct interest in wanting to write the fourth gospel. We also know that John was one of the closest disciples to the Lord, along with Peter and James, and that he um, is referred to in a number of extremely important instances that occurred in our Lord Jesus' life and ministry, those short, short three years where he was ministering um, before his crucifixion. I've just pulled them out um, so to give you some idea of, of how important those instances were. The, the first was where um, John was present along with our Lord Jesus Christ, and only a handful of the disciples was, were with our Lord at that particular time when um, they raised the daughter of Jairus, referred to in Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8. John was present at the transfiguration, as described in Matthew chapter 17, Mark chapter 9, and Luke chapter 9. And there were three, along with Andrew, who asked the Lord about the Olivet prophecy in Mark's account. In Mark chapter 14. And clearly one of those was John as well. And the last instance was um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, that very important moment when our Lord was preparing for what was coming next and was in extreme angst and anguish. And along with him, a little behind him and a little asleep behind him, unfortunately, were none other than Peter, James, and John. So clearly the loved disciple. Um, played an important role and was, had first-hand evidence of a number of important events that took place in our Lord's life. And simply put, if, if the Lord, if, if the loved disciple was not the Apostle John, then there really was no place for him in the first three Gospels. And yet he's referred to on a number of occasions in the first three Gospels. Um, and put another way, if he wasn't the Apostle who wrote the fourth Gospel, there was really no point in him being referred to in the first three. It's also um, generally agreed that the gospel writer was a Jew of Palestine, who John was, and was an eyewitness. And, um, and John in his books, um, in fact, claims that he was an eyewitness. In John, um, in what, sorry, that should read, uh, in, that should read 1 John 1, verses 1 to 3, where, um, it, it, sorry, it is correct. In, one, in John 1, verses 1 to 3, where he talks about, in the beginning, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The epistle, the letter of John, in 1 John 1, verses 1 to 3, again he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. So clearly, he is talking about a first-hand event, that which we have seen, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, of the Word of Life. For the, life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto, unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly that our fellowship with the Father, and with the Son, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So, the first opening lines of the epistle declare that John was a witness of our Lord Jesus Christ, and again, strongly supports that he was the gospel writer. And then if we turn to sort of more empirical evidence, um, there were a number of early writers, both for and against the truth uh, of the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ in the early centuries, uh, not long after our Lord had ascended, um, which, um, and a couple of them may have even been around before John died, who um, declared uh, that they had seen him, spoken to him, or referred to him 
And ironically, some of the best sources which appear to confirm that John was the writer of the fourth gospel were in fact um, heretics who uh, were tempted to discredit the truth and in doing so made several references to John chapter 9. Um, I've just pulled out a couple of other instances from the early um, centuries that who made reference or make reference to John. Um, and the fragment, the first one is the Greek apostolic father, Bishop um, Papias, uh, as he is referred to. Uh, he was the Bishop of Heropolis in what was then, uh, what is current day Turkey, should I say. And you can see that he lived from around 60, B, uh, 60 AD to about 130 AD. And so the view being that uh, John was around at least 90 AD, in fact, there's a lot of the people who hold the view that John wrote his gospel around 90 AD, um, there was a clear overlap. He could well have, have met and spoken to John directly. Um, and his uh, comments or quotations about John uh, occur in a work known as Against Heresies, um, which was prepared by a writer known as Irenaeus, who died in AD 202. And Irenaeus says that Papias listened to John. So quite clearly a first-hand um, evidence and, and quite clearly a first-hand direct discussion about John and his beliefs. A little bit later was uh, Clement, uh, Titius Flavius Clement, who's also known as Clement of Alexandra. Um, he was a Christian theologian, 150 AD to around 215 AD. And he relates the tradition that John returned to Patmos, which is referred to in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. Uh, to Eph he returned from Patmos, I should I say, to Ephesus after the death of the Emperor Domitian in AD 96. And he attributed the fourth gospel to the Apostle John, that is uh, Clement, uh, attributed the, the fourth gospel to John, saying that John wrote a spiritual gospel to supplement the accounts of the synoptic gospels, in other words, the first three gospels of the book. And the last little bit of empirical evidence is this tiny little dot over here. Um, and whilst not directly referring or confirming that John was the author of the gospel, but nonetheless proving that it was written while the apostle was believed to still be alive, uh, is the um, manuscript that was found, as is known as the Rylands Papyrus, and it dated no later than around 100, about AD 125. And it contains... Uh, small fragments from the book of John, um, specifically John chapter 18 on the one side, verses 31 to 34. And then on the other side of this piece of papyrus um, was John chapter 18, verses 37 and 38. And this slither was found in Egypt. Um, and if John's gospel was written in Ephesus uh, around the AD 90, as some scholars believe, it indicates that it had spread quite quickly throughout the Christian world of the time. And that John's gospel was widely quoted by the heretics in the second and third centuries is, again, further evidence of the fact um, of its distribution. So if we accept then that there's ample evidence that John wrote the fourth gospel, then what about the wonderful way in which it is written? And perhaps that's the part that really is the best introduction to understanding the first few verses of John chapter 1. So firstly, what is very important and interesting about uh, John's gospel is that he provides us with um, the purpose of why he wrote the book. In chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31, John explains that, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, and I've then highlighted the important part, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Now, importance, the importance of that is once you're given a purpose for something. So if we take someone who wants to write a scientific paper, they're going to start off by saying the um purpose of me conducting this particular experiment about what, why butterflies are purple in a particular orchard uh, is the following. Um, and they, they explain the purpose up front, and then they go into their scientific analysis. They've gathered all the data, they do the analysis of the data, and then they reach the conclusion. But when you then read that scientific paper, you need to read it with what we call a purposive approach, purpose of understanding. In other words, we need to go back to the purpose. What was the purpose of undertaking that particular study? 
So with that in mind, John says to us, the purpose of why I wrote my gospel is, firstly, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, hopefully, he achieves his purpose amongst all Christians, because quite clearly, I hopefully, that all Christians believe that Jesus is the Christ. And the second purpose of him writing it is that Jesus is the Son of God, not God the Son. So in understanding and interpreting those first few verses of John chapter 1, we need to keep that purpose in mind, because that was John's purpose. It wasn't any other. And we're going to read a couple of other uh, views on what John chapter 1 might mean, but that wasn't what John intended the purpose of his gospel to be. Then stylistically, uh, John's words echo the words of the Lord in many respects. His style of writing resembles the passion and the directness of him whom he acknowledges to be the master. In many respects, John's words are simple, and yet they are extremely profound. And certainly that's what I, I discover each time I read them. They seem extremely simple, and yet they sit with you. Unlike any other book of the Bible, they sit with me each time I read them. The more they are studied, their depth becomes evident. And that befits the subject matter. For John discusses the highest claims made by any man. And I've just put a couple of them up there um, to give you an idea. In other words, John re references Jesus talking about some of the most important things, things that no other ordinary man would ever speak about. Certainly not any other sane man could speak about openly in public. So, for example, Jesus talks about as the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. That's quite a claim. So, he that eateth me shall live by me. I speak that which I have seen with my Father, Father being God. If God were your Father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Some extremely profound words. And yet these are words are simple enough for even a child to comprehend. But it's really, as we'll see, only once the eyes of understanding have been opened and enlightened that we can appreciate that they talk to the fact that Christ is seen as the manifestation of God's power. Provided for men and for women's salvation, John's gospel helps us grasp that great mystery, which is really the great mystery of the truth. God manifests in the flesh. So let's turn then to the first few verses of, of John chapter 14, so John chapter 1, and, and try and understand exactly how John explains, uh, or how God explains himself through John's writings and how Christ explains. And I've highlighted there just the first two verses, and I've highlighted specific words. First, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse two, the same was in the beginning. The same was in the beginning with God. That being the King James version, I've just added uh, or repeated verse two using different translations. I didn't go through all of the different translations. I just pulled out four. Um, I thought there would be a, enough of a, a, a sample, but in all four of them, they translate the words the same as He. So we then, if we read that, in the beginning was the Word. And in, chapter, in verse 2, he was with God in the beginning. And uh, as I said, I've used the, the NIV, the CJB, the ESV, New King James Version. All of them make that particular reference. Now, what is immediately that raises the question once you read that is who or what is the word? Also, who or what is the same? And lastly, if we're going to use the other translations, who or what is he? And it's perhaps the last word, the translation of the same as he, that has probably caused the most confusion. Um, he, of course, as we know, in the ordinary sense, denotes a person. And if it denotes, if it denotes a person in this particular instance, well, then the person, whoever he was, was with God in the beginning. And leaving aside which beginning is being referred to in John chapter 1 for the moment, um, we are referring to, we need to consider the connection between he or the same and the word expressed with capital letters. And just as an aside from, from the sources that I, I read, apparently the capital W in word there is really a translation blip. Um, it shouldn't be with a W, 
uh, and it wouldn't be with the W in the in the in the Greek. But um, as, but in fact, that that whole sentence was apparently in capitals when it was written in the Greek, and somewhere along in the translations, it was left in the cap of a capital W. Nonetheless, we need to understand who these players are. So if he is a person, who is he who was not created in the beginning? Because he was with God in the beginning, but already existed with God. Now, what is hopefully the case, because I haven't studied every Christian denomination, is that all Christians and all denominations believe that the first man who was actually created was Adam. The Bible tells us Adam and Eve were the first created humans. So John chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 can't be talking about Adam because Adam wasn't there when God was there, and clearly that's what John chapter 1 talks about. So therefore the he, if he is a man, can only be a special man with a special connection to God, and the only man who fits that description would of course be our Lord Jesus Christ. And if that is so, then the revelation in John chapter 1 and verse 1 becomes even larger, because if Jesus is the word, then not only was Jesus with God in the beginning, um, in the beginning and before the beginning, but Jesus is God. Just looking at the words up there, if Jesus, if the he is Jesus and Jesus is the word, then the word was God. Now, whilst John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 are not the only verses out of that book, and certainly out of the Bible that the Trinitarians use to claim um, or to, to justify their, their um, belief. Certainly it's one of the most important uh, for claiming the doctrine of the Trinity. The majority of the passages of Scripture that are cited in support of the doctrine of the Trinity are to be found. This so happens in the Gospel of John. So in order to understand the relationship between John's writings and the doctrine of the Trinity, and we're not going to go into any great detail, particularly because the audience here, most of you, if not all of you already don't hold the view, the Trinity has any sway, but just for the purposes of us properly understanding John chapter 1, we must first briefly examine what the doctrine of the Trinity is. And I'll put a, a, a painting up there which pictorially describes what it is. It essentially affirms that there is only one God who consists of three entities, and you can see there there's the grey-bearded individual, who presumably is God the Father, Jesus sitting next to him on his right-hand side, and the um, Holy Spirit depicted by the dove or the bird sitting in between them, and Jesus obviously raising his three fingers depicting the Trinity. So it really describes as, um, it's usually described as persons, three persons, being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but it's emphatically stressed that in spite of, of, of this, the Trinity is not three, but one. And that is generally described in that particular picture over there. So we have this rather uh, mathematically uh, uh, interesting picture where God is placed in the center. And around it, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that then declares that the Father is God, that the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But they remain three people because the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Son is not the God. So, um, it's a neat picture, but when you start to think about it, it becomes a little bit um, a bit more complicated. And, and probably the first irrationality, if we keep John chapter 1, verse 1 in mind, that jumps out, is how can something or someone exist before it existed? Um, if you just give that some thought, you'll appreciate that already there's a problem with the, the Trinity doctrine as it stands. But nevertheless, we can see, um, uh, one can see how the discussion John 1 and verses 1 and 2, that the he, if you're going to consider it to be a, a human he, is the word that he was with God in the beginning, uh, and that he was God, could lead to the Trinitarian view that this passage is evidence that, of the, that the Trinitarian view is supported by biblical proof. But we, of course, know that it is not proof at all, and that the doctrine of the Trinity is not true. In fact, the term, the Trinity, Trinity is not mentioned once in the Bible, not once. Uh, apparently, the Bible contains something like 770,000 words, and it's not mentioned in any one of them. So to claim that the doctrine 
of the Trinity is essential to salvation, and yet it does not appear once in the whole of Scripture, should already be starting to ring alarm bells with people who want to start to accept the view as being something important and true. A doctrine based on a single scriptural quotation is at best precarious. So even if it appeared once in the Bible, it would be a little precarious to rely on it fully without reading it in the full context of the Bible. But one that you're going to rely on that's not mentioned even once is, in fact, completely untenable. It's also accepted that the doctrine didn't develop at the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. Neither Christ nor any of his apostles ever preached the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not evident in any of the writings. And in fact, the Athanasian Creed, from which it was really ultimately derived, was developed over a number of centuries and was composed ultimately in AD 500. So 500 years after our Lord Jesus Christ had risen. So what's even more important, though, aside from those obvious difficulties that you have with the Trinity view, is that the Bible and, and the, and the Scriptures in the Bible, in fact, talk against that view in great in a number of instances. Um, the New Testament, in particular, for example, and I put up just two sample examples there of Paul's writing. Firstly, one Corinthians chapter eight, verses five and six, quite clearly explains that God and Christ and the Holy Spirit are not one and the same. But he says, for though they may, for though. They, be, so, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are gods many and lords many, then the important part, yet to us there is one God, the Father of whom all things, and we unto him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things, and we through him. Now the meaning of this passage, I would hope, could hardly be any clearer. Paul clearly makes a distinction between one God and one Lord Jesus Christ. It should be noted that the Holy Spirit, in fact, is not even mentioned by Paul in that particular passage. And in writing to the Ephesians, he says in chapter 4, there is one body and one spirit, even uh, uh, as also ye were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Unambiguous, I would have thought, that one God and one Father, uh, and no reference to one God and one Father and one Son, no reference to God the Son in any of that. And in fact, the, the doctrine of the Trinity has probably correctly been described um, as Christianity's self-inflicted wound. It's made what was a wonderfully important and powerful message uh, and powerful part of God's purpose and plan uh, confusing and um, an interrelated and, and, and unnecessarily complex and simply untrue. Because those who believe in that doctrine clearly have no understanding of the nature of God. They have no understanding of the nature of Jesus. Probably the most important part, to believe that Jesus is God the Son, really loses the entire force and impact of the fact that Jesus was a man, a man who had to live a life as we did, but had to overcome everything that we couldn't overcome. And the fact that he did is, is what is important, and the fact that he did is what gives us the hope for our salvation. And the Trinity Code means that they've lost entirely the meaning of the atonement for our sins, and it means that they've lost entirely that Jesus is our high priest and not our God. So if that's not what the prologue teaches us, what then does the prologue in fact tell us in John chapter 1, and verses 1 and 2? Well, Brother John Carter holds a view which I think is, is correct, and that is that the Gospel of John gives us the divine genealogy of Jesus. The emphasis being on divine genealogy, because unlike um, Matthew, in Matthew chapter 1 we are given the um, human genealogy of, G of Jesus. In other words, it describes the, um, all the, the individuals who came before our Lord Jesus Christ came and the, and the links um, that Jesus had to all of them um, through the ages. John's genealogy is a spiritual one. It's a transgression, it's a progression, as we'll see, from one epoch to another epoch, and a very important genealogy it is. And he adds, Brother Carter, that is, that the Old Testament provides the true background to John's gospel. He says that 
Uh, it is there that we find the ideas which best explain John's thoughts um, and in the language which John chose to use as well. So, for example, and as I put up on that particular slide, the passages referred to in Deuteronomy and in Isaiah, um, where God himself declares, Here, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I am God alone, and besides me, there is no other, no other God. So, an emphatic a direct statement from God as to who he is in our particular lives. And that genealogy is then drawn through by John, as we'll see in his, um, in his opening verse in John chapter 1. And the second clear link between John's gospel and the Old Testament is its clear echo to the prologue of Genesis chapter 1. And again, uh, any of those of us who've read Genesis 1 will immediately see the connection between the words that John uses and the, and the words that are used in Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis chapter 1, starting with, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And John, starting with, in the beginning, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So clearly, both are referring to the beginning. And the beginning of what? Now, God, we know from the Old Testament, and this again is drawn through by John in his in his, in his gospel, is that God's creative word, so the word of God, in order to understand what the word of God is, is really given quasi-personification. In other words, given human-like attributes, the word of God, in a number of instances in the Old Testament. I've put a few of them up there. Um, if we just run through them very briefly, a lot of them will be very familiar to you. Um, where in Psalm 33, it says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. So by the word, it's given some personification. It's as though God sent out an individual, go and make the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. In Psalm 107, verse 20, he says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. So the word healed them. So the word again is given sort of quasi-personification. In Psalm 147, in verse 15, he sendeth forth his commandment on the earth, his word runneth very swiftly. We've got a, a word running around, spreading the gospel over the earth. And again, we have the image of this delivery man spreading the word running around the earth. And Isaiah, referring to the rain and the snow which come from heaven to water the earth, according to God's purpose, adds in his uh, chapter 15, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereof I sent it. So the word has now got a particular task, and the word is sent out by God in order to accomplish a particular purpose. And from there, the thought of the word of God as expression of his will to the effect of it becoming an execution. In other words, it's the, the, what we could pick up from the Old Testament references that I've given you now is that the word wasn't just a thought. The word wasn't just a statement. It wasn't just an expression. It was something that had thought and wisdom and power because the word was sent out to accomplish a particular task and to achieve a particular goal. And once we appreciate that that is what the word of God is, it's not the ordinary word as we understand it, just a simple passage of writing, that it is God's power as well as his wisdom. It isn't difficult then to transition the understanding of word in that context to understanding that it passes easily to a person who becomes the manifestation of the word. In other words, God-directed power, God-directed wisdom becomes manifest in the flesh um, in the form of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who did um, his God's will perfectly. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul perhaps explains it best in, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 12 and 13, where he says, for the word of God is living. I've emphasized that because that clearly expresses that we've gone from the word in the Old Testament, that was the word of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, exercising God's wisdom and power of thought, to the word of God is now living. And Paul can only be referring to our Lord Jesus Christ. And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, 
and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So, clearly that's starting to give us an idea of what the word is intended to mean. So, Paul explains that we really start with the word, um, or the, the logos, as it's also referred to, and I'll explain that in a moment, is, is that the word initially was the revelation of God, which was spoken in the days of Moses, spoken in the day, again in the days of Noah. So the word in the beginning in Genesis was the word of God revealing God's purpose and plan, and which was living by the time of Paul's day. And Acts, the word, purpose of the word, both the, re the revelatory word, the creative word, and the word in the flesh, the purpose of the word was to move our minds and our hearts from a revelation um, which simply hears something to a understanding things which are hidden from the world. And in the New Testament, to the one who is God's high priest, the word made flesh. That really is the outcome of the operation of God's word that we need to understand that it will be manifested in him and that it was embodied in his flesh. So, and we can see that really through this slide, the word or the logos, and as I said, we'll come to talk to the logos now, but word used as the creation of God that was in the Old Testament, word is the revelation of God that was spoken to the prophets and the writers, to Moses and Abraham and to David, and then to the word made flesh. But all of them were the word. All of them, therefore, were connected to God. Now, the term word is a translation of, uh, is a translation of logos, and from which word, logos, is to derive the word logic, the Greek word logic, uh, English word logic, derived from the, word lo the Greek word logos. And the relative Greek adjective is defined for word, we're talking about now, is defined in the dictionary of or pertaining to um, speech or reason, uh, or reasoning, rational, reasonable. Um, whereas under uh, the definition of logos, um, the century dictionary defines it as that which is said or spoken, a word, a saying, speech, also the power of the mind manifested in speech and reason. Um, and I've emphasized there from the definition of logos, firstly, that it is uh, the thought of wisdom and power in action. So in other words, logos or logic in this particular usage is not just a thought, it's not just inert wisdom that God might have, it is wisdom in action. And you'll see all of them in each instance, the thought and the action come together. It's pretty much like uh, what we are taught in James as well. You can't simply believe in Christ, you have to action your belief. And that's exactly what the word or the wisdom or logos here is intended to mean as well, that there is a thought and there is an action. So there is a power, there is the thought of wisdom and power in action, there's a thought and expression, there is a design and execution. All of that fits under the meaning of the logos. What we know, and I've put the word logos then into John chapter 1, verse 1, is that the logos or the power and the logic of God existed from the beginning. The Logos was with God, and the Logos was divine. The phrase that the Logos was God is really then just adjectival, as I've explained there. It was describing the nature of the word, or the mind of God that became a person. So, if we summarize John chapter 1, just verses 1 and 2, what it's really telling us is, in the beginning, uh, the beginning, uh, the beginning in John relates to the spiritual world. So as opposed to Genesis chapter 1, John chapter 1 verse 1 is the beginning of the spiritual world characterized by the divine revelation, the word of God made manifest in Christ. So it was the beginning of the manifestation of the word of God in Christ, our Savior. That was the beginning of uh, the gospel. And it places the gospel message in its the eternal context. So as I've already said, it began with the creative word of God. The whole purpose was of the purpose of God was really centered around our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we don't believe that Christ was an afterthought. We don't believe that Christ was um, a, a, 
the lust of class that God thought about when he realized that his people weren't listening to him when they were following their own ways and disobeying him in every instance. He thought, well, look, let me try another plan. I'll, I'll send uh, my son and he'll be able to fix the problem. We know that Christ formed a central part of God's plan with this earth from before the time that he created the earth. So Christ was the central feature of God's wisdom and plan from before the beginning, both of the creation and of the manifestation of Christ. I said the promise of the provision of a redeemer in Eden was not the announcement of a rescue plan, rather it was God's intention to be glorified by the arrangements he had devised from before time began. Now, God's purpose, as we know, really centered on Christ. Um, and Paul in Colossians chapter 1 and verses 14 to 18 summarizes that particularly well. And it's worth just reading through it. Paul says, in whom we have our redemption, the forgiveness of our sins, who is the image of the invisible God. So that's how close Christ is to God, the firstborn of all creation, the new creation, for in him were all things created in the heavens and upon the earth, things visible, things invisible, through the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things have been created through him and unto him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is, in, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Um, so, clearly, God's purpose of Christ becoming flesh, and John continues in verse 14, where the word became flesh, so we know now the purpose of God's word and the manifestation of the word, and the word became flesh. So there was the manifestation that, that John talks of in verse 14. And he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory uh, as of only the begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So John closes the loop. If there was any confusion in verses 1 and 2, once we understand what the word means, John then explains that God manifestation took place by God manifesting his power and his glory in the flesh in the form of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he then goes on, in, in, if we read John uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we beheld and our hands have handled concerning the, the word of life, and that which was manifested we have seen and bear witness and declare to you unto the life, the life eternal, being our Lord Jesus Christ. So to end off, just to summarize what John is teaching us in John chapter 1, and, uh, and from verses 1 to 18, and we haven't gone through each one of those verses in, in great detail simply because we, we don't have the time to, in a short lecture. But firstly, in John chapter 1, he tells us, in, and in verse 1, that on the one hand, there's, there's one and only one infinite God who knows the end from the beginning, and that's declared through his logos, both the physical beginning of creation in Genesis chapter 1 and the spiritual beginning of the manif his manifestation in the flesh of Christ in John chapter 1. We know from John chapter 1 that the word uh, that the, the, the meaning of the word that he uses in those passages means logos, and we know that logos is not simply God's thought, but it's wisdom and power in action, and that aligns neatly with our Lord Jesus Christ um, becoming manif God manifest in the flesh, or God's power manifest in the flesh. John provides us um, with the divine genealogy of Christ. In other words, where did Christ? spiritual genealogy commence from where did he get the power we know how christ was born we know how christ was conceived the other gospels tell us that but where did god where did christ get that spiritual power that he had in order to overcome the human nature that all of us fall short in overcoming and john explains that to us right at the beginning he tells us where christ received his spiritual genealogy from he tells us that the word used by john is manifest through christ and he tells us that it was part of God's plan before the, um, before the beginning. And he says that up front in, in verses 1 and verse 2. His intention of manifesting his power was with him before he created the earth. 
He also tells us in verse 9 that the word manifest provides the light to the enlightenment in a dark world. And so um, by manifesting his word in Christ, um, God was able to shine that light through Christ in a world which had darkened its heart, had darkened its eyes and turned away from understanding of the world. And in verse 14, as we've just said, and so the word became flesh through the only begotten son. And in verse 18, which ends off the prologue, Paul explains that it's really only the one, the one that is that intimately associated with the Father. He refers to Christ being in the bosom of the Father. So in other words, um, it, it, an individual who has such a close relationship through the Word, through God manifestation in him, that could reveal God, that could reveal God's divine character, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.